Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the IT News Podcast. Our guest this week is Katie James, the head of digital at Flybys. Now, Flybys, like many organisations, is undergoing a digital transformation. This has already seen it migrate its application estate to the cloud. What's interesting now, though, is the next phase, which includes the modernization of one of its most core systems, FMS, the Flybys member service. Join us as we discuss what modernization and transformation at Flybys has accomplished so far and what the future looks like. Tell us a little bit about the role and remit of digital at Flybys. I understand that digital sits within the technology organization, but how does that function look, perhaps in terms of people or the mix of skills or capabilities? Yeah, absolutely. So digital sits within technology, and that's obviously, I think, a moving beast for lots of organisations at the moment to work out where the role of digital sits. At Flybys, sitting within technology, it's really that we are an enablement function. So just because the digital team is within this scope doesn't mean that other parts of the business in our operations and marketing and other areas aren't themselves having digital capability and digital team members. It's more that the digital technology enablement sits with us. And so the things that sit under that in our world Uh, UX and experience design, marketing technology, and the front-end delivery and management of our digital assets, which includes both things like our digital API services and microservices, and the actual front-ends across website and apps, essentially. So when you say that there's digital capabilities in other parts of flybys, do they report into you or do you, what kind of relationship do you have between all the different parts of digital and the central digital enablement function? No, so they don't report into me. They're almost like our key stakeholders. So our marketing teams who manage, say, the digital marketing activity and the digital media buying would work very closely with all of our teams around the things that they need across our digital ecosystem to support the activities that they're trying to run. So they'll continue to run an end-to-end digital marketing program within that team. And then they use us as subject matter experts in terms of how to capitalize on our marketing technology capability, what kind of experiences they need delivered on our websites and apps, and what kind of like tagging and other things that happen in that space. So I wouldn't call it reporting lines. I'd say it's more like a modernized version of scrums that come together where you have the digital capability in terms of SMEs sitting within our space. And then you have equivalent people sitting in other spaces that come together from a planning and squads perspective to deliver the outcomes end to end. And who sets the strategy within that kind of structure for the direction that digital goes? You've probably got a couple of different lenses to that, depending on where into the ecosystem you're getting. So at a organisational level, we obviously establish a flybys level strategy and flybys level OKRs that then filter down within the teams. But then different functions would have different strategic outcomes they're trying to derive that will deliver against those. So as a digital team, we would set the strategy for what are the capabilities that flybys needs to unlock the potential of the program. But marketing would be writing strategies around what kind of audience groups they'd like to get to, what kind of outcomes they'd like to deliver from them. And they'd essentially come to us with that brief. Do you know what I mean? They'd be like, we have personas at Flybys. They might come to us with a brief that's like, hey, we want to target persona X and we want to drive this particular behaviour from them. And that would be their overarching metric they're trying to drive towards. We would provide that support around how the digital ecosystem or the digital channels can support them in delivering against that objective. I think I understand. So basically, when you're talking about marketing, for example, they've got a problem and they're not necessarily defining it within digital terms. But if they take it to digital enablement, then it will ultimately end up as a digital led or digitally driven project. Absolutely. And so that's a really key point that our strategies are not trying to be channel led outcomes. Our strategies are focusing on customer or business outcomes. And then there are a range of different areas that might need to come together to solve that problem. Because I'll bring that into the experience space. At the end of the day, in a program like Flybys, the journey that a customer goes on is multi-channel and it involves both online and offline behaviours. And if you silo your strategies just into single channels, really you're just creating lots of handover points. So this is about kind of centralizing that thinking to go, what's the outcome we're trying to achieve? What areas of the ecosystem are impacted by that outcome? And then different people would be involved in that based on the skill set that they're bringing to the table. And you mentioned a couple of different areas there that digital enablement covers. So you're able to give us a sense of the size of resource that digital enablement has, particularly maybe down into some of those capability areas? 
Yep. So probably what I didn't mention within our structure is that product and technology work very closely together. So we have a product and technology group that then supports the broader business. And so our resource structure is dependent on how many squads we essentially have that can run on concurrent work. So within my area, we have essentially six squads. We have the UX squad, the MarTech squad, and then we have two platform teams, one for web and content, one for mobile. And then we have two feature delivery squads called our member acquisition and our member engagement team. So when you think about the skills that I just spoke about, there will be UX designers, marketing technology people, React developers, mobile engineers across each of those different squads. So I would say actually we are still pretty lean. So my UX design function, there's five of them in total, but there's five of them split across those different squads. And some of those squads need more of a particular skill than others. So the feature delivery teams are doing a lot of direct customer outcome driving. So you have a high amount of UX design necessity within those teams. But say our mobile platform team, they're working on automation, and design systems and things like that where they definitely need an amount of capacity, but they don't have a roadmap that necessarily determines that they need 100% of a UX designer all year round. And how are you prioritising the time available, I guess, to address some of this pipeline of work within fairly lean squads? The starting point really is kind of our corporate plan cycle, which many organisations would have. So the starting point is that organisational level priority. So what are the big rocks that Flybys is going after? When we unpick those big rocks, so we do some sort of lean canvas process, some sort of deep dive into what's involved. We confirm it's an idea worth going after. And there's a bit of an impact assessment in the discovery phase around the areas of the ecosystem that we need to follow suit with these. And that impact assessment kind of determines the teams that we'll go into. So we do an annual cycle for the bigger long list of initiatives, and then we go into a quarterly refinement cycle of what that work will be. And probably the difference between, say, our platform and our product teams is our platform teams are looking a quarter earlier ahead going, what are the product teams going to be looking to do? What are the things that are going to hold them back? And their roadmaps are really driven by unlocking capabilities that simplify delivery for the product teams. The product teams are responding to business and market briefs around what opportunities should we be focused on and going after. And so that's the annual cycle within a quarterly refinement cycle to see whether the ideas that we're going after are still valid and still the number one priority for the business. I wanted to ask a little bit about the evolution of digital at flybys. And I wondered, has digital changed dramatically in the time that you've been involved with it at the organisation? Yeah, I mean, I have been with Flybys from back when we were still a business unit within the Coles business and through the entire separation process to establish Flybys as an independent entity. So if I think about the role and the nature of digital then, in a beast as big as Coles, we were just one very small cog in a model that's much more fragmented, but for logical reasons because of the size and scale of Coles. So if I think about my original role, all of digital was housed under really more the campaign side of it. So we sat within market we had digital media, we had the digital assets, and we had the studio team that does design outcomes and those kind of works. But we weren't necessarily doing any of the bigger product work. We were trying to, but we were trying to do it off the side of our desk. So we weren't designing and thinking of the next big digital feature that could be delivered. We were more driving the day-to-day -day of the program. In separating from Coles, we also then centralised with technology. And the biggest thing with that change is that we brought engineering and UX design much, much closer together. So actually kind of bring that into the bread and butter of how we deliver change. And so I think the biggest change that that has meant more than anything is that we're really pushing towards those worlds where UX experience and design is just an embedded part of how you deliver digital experiences. And how you deliver digital experiences is through strong engineering, modern technologies, automation and all of those elements and bringing them into a much closer closer ecosystem of how you actually deliver them out the door. So essentially here it was about kind of how we create greater, more efficient pipelines of delivery for our core digital assets. And that's very different to what we were like in our previous model. I would assume that the macro environment for loyalty has changed a lot as well. And it's really elevated beyond marketing in a sense, and really much more now about creating data-driven economies. And I imagine that has had an influence on the direction of digital within flybys as well. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think that's one of the key elements of why there was a need or a desire to create flybys as a central hub for the shareholder group, not necessarily one specific part of the business, because what we do today with data and the size of the data sharing platforms that we have for our partners is fundamentally different to what just running a day-to-day -day loyalty program looked like three or four years ago. And I actually think at the heart of why that has happened and this kind of reinvigoration of loyalty is that in a world where 
privacy and consent and how you build relationships with people in digital ecosystems is changing. Loyalty programs have that benefit of you've actually willingly asked someone, do they want to be a part of this program? And you've got that one-to-one relationship with them to build on. That's not necessarily new to us because that's what we've always done. But the value of that customer sign up in a loyalty concept is different today to what it was a few years ago, particularly when you think about what's happening with cookies and the changes of terms of what people expect. That's kind of, I think, the extra value that's created by creating these links between Flyby's members and the brands that they shop at and then continuing to invest in those links. So you've touched very briefly on infrastructure there. I think it's worth just unpacking that a little bit more. Obviously, Flybys has a huge amount of Australians in the program. I think the numbers are somewhere around one third of Australians. So it would be worth understanding, I think, a little bit about the digital and data environment that supports that enormous ecosystem. I'll talk in terms of tools and things initially because it's probably the easiest. So from a data warehousing perspective, we use Snowflake. And so all of our data that is captured and collected sits in a Snowflake instance. What I was touching on there in terms of the changes of data sharing is once upon a time, there would have been, like many organisations, a Flybys data warehouse. All of the data that came to Flybys would go into that warehouse. We would do all the crunching and the smarts associated with it. And we would tell people about outcomes. What we've actually done now with our shareholder group, so that includes the Wes Farmers brands, you know, Kmart, Target, Bunnings, Officeworks, and the Coles Group brands, so the liquor brands, supermarkets is we're creating independent data sharing platforms for each of those relationships. So all of our shared data assets between the brands are connected in each individual data sharing platform. The benefit of that or a way to think about it is a customer goes into a Bunnings and swipes their Flybys card. Bunnings collects that initial run of transactional information and data. They share that data with Flybys. Flybys receive that into the Flybys ecosystem and the data sharing platforms. And then we essentially in real time share it back to an instance of Snowflake that is specific for Bunnings and Flybys. And so the one-to-one relationship between customers and their information with Bunnings is in each of those individual environments. So you can run the individual brands separately, but you can also create, say, a data lab or a data ecosystem centrally that brings together all of that richness for a member at a central level that is agnostic to the individual brands. So this is allowing greater personalization potentially for that customer yeah. and that relationship they have with that brand. Yeah, greater personalization and greater enrichment of their shopping experience through an understanding of their behavior across more parts of their, say, weekly shop. Okay. And so that's the Snowflake and the cloud and data ingestion engine. Are there other technology elements that are particularly widely used within your operation at Flybase? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot more tech involved in getting it there. And there are still some older school techs involved. We're still relying on batch processes to get us that original run of data. And then we're using modern cloud technology to cut out the timeframes that sit between each of those steps. From a hosting perspective, everything that we're doing is in AWS. I think you would have seen that in some of the articles in terms of what we do. So we're fully hosted in AWS. So there's a hell of a lot of jobs that run through intermediary technologies to actually help power that process. From a marketing technology perspective, we have a mixed bag of technologies involved. We're heavy users of the Adobe platform. But we also have some Oracle capabilities as well. And we're looking at all sorts of other tools all of the time. So one of the things about being a loyalty program that represents a number of other brands is it's quite important for us to see ourselves as technology agnostic. So even that data sharing example I gave to you, some of the brands we work with are not using AWS at all. They're using Azure. So our patterns don't dictate how we operate with other people. And so we do actually support AWS or Azure and we will support Snowflake. But if you have another solution, we will support another solution. So we're connecting a number of different pieces together to create more vendor agnostic solutions that benefit the people who integrate with us rather than dictating the terms of how they play ball with us. I think maybe it'd be worth touching a little bit on Flyby's digital transformation. Mm -hmm. We kind of alluded to it with some of the responses previously, but I'm actually unsure of the status of that program. Can you give us a sense of the effort, some of the key pillars and where things are at? So I guess there's a couple of really distinct phases in what we're doing here. And I think like many businesses, once you're on a digital transformation journey, there's not necessarily a point where it ends, particularly in a continuous delivery model. So if I say the phase one or the core that was previously spoken about in the media was taking the 25 years of flybys that existed within the Coles ecosystem and had a lot of on-prem solutions specific to that environment and separating out of that technology and getting us into the cloud as an independent entity, that phase is complete. So we've been able to... 100% move our technology out of Coles and we are a 100% cloud-based business at Flybys. That said, 
just moving your technology to the cloud doesn't necessarily mean that you're benefiting from all the modernization and capability that it offers you. So in terms of where we're at right now is we have data platforms that are very greenfields because we've been able to build them from scratch in our new environments and set new standards for them from day dot because they were ones that we just transferred the data, but we rebuilt the ecosystem. But then we have, say, core loyalty offerings. So a lot of what we do within our loyalty program, which is why you won't hear me talking about CRMs or anything like that, is actually built on a custom platform done by Flybys many, many, many years ago called FMS, which means our Flybys member service. Now, to get that into the cloud was already quite a milestone in itself because you're taking legacy technology that still uses things like COBOL and getting it into a very, very modern environment. But what needs to happen next is to really transform that to get the best of it because we might be on AWS, but we're still just using COBOL-based batch jobs to get certain things done. So that's how I'd describe it in terms of digital transformation is there's a heck of a lot of work just to get yourself into a position to benefit from modern technology. And then depending on the state of your legacy architecture or the work that you need to do within that space, there are another significant amount of steps to then work out, well, what's the opportunity for the business in modernizing these processes? If I automate these elements here, what am I going to gain on the customer side? Like, am I just going to process jobs faster? If I do that faster, am I going to be able to do more? Am I going to be able to create new capabilities that were previously a blocker? We're kind of in that stage of the journey, which is now that we've got these things here, which ones of them are fine and we're just going to contain them as they are and which ones of them really lend themselves towards a complete modernization to really capitalize on the benefit of that change. Okay. And have there been any decisions made on elements for modernization that would particularly affect your area, for example? Yeah. So if I use that one that I mentioned before, FMS, it's a combination of, say, a marketing service, so like a classic CRM, a reward service and a partner management service. But at the moment, it's all clustered together in one monolithic beast. So at a starting point decision, we're looking to separate that into its independent ecosystems just to minimise and simplify the size of each of these ecosystems. And then in each of those pieces of work, what's happening currently is the analysis around, do we build something custom again? Do we buy something off the shelf? Do we do a bit of both? But the starting point is take what it does today, break it down into three or four core areas and then start to unpick in those core areas what the better combinations of technologies are to deliver those services in a modern way. Uh, That makes sense because I think I saw last year or towards the end of last year, a press release or some sort of announcement around reward technology being incorporated in. And that's a great example. So we have partnered with a loyalty industry specific reward platform called RewardOps, which has been great for us. And we're getting a lot of benefit from that change. But there's always in these processes when you integrate a certain point where that handover from the platform that you've purchased goes into your ecosystem. And so what I'm talking about in terms of separating out the rest of the rewards is the core flybys backend that interacts with that platform. So this is the perfect example of partial modernization. So we've got a new platform built to a modern standard that we interact with our front end in all the ways that we want that is still talking to a legacy back-end platform from Flybys. And so the next step is what do we do with that legacy back-end platform? Now, I was listening to on another podcast where you were talking a little bit about the dual lens that's applied to doing things at Flybys. That lens, to paraphrase it, I think, was that whether members see what you do as a fair and transparent process and whether they get reasonable value in return for what they give up, which presumably is some of their data. Um, So this is talking a little bit to the balancing consent and privacy discussion in loyalty. And obviously you alluded to it earlier and you you kind of said that this is not new for flybys. This is something you've been doing for a long time, but it'd be just interesting, I guess, to get your thoughts about where things are at in that part of the ecosystem. Yeah, yeah. Um, So I think what was really important about that comment and people would have seen this happen in their day-to-day lives as I I mentioned it earlier too as people prepare for a cookie-less world so when you think about that concept of you can have a first party relationship with somebody a second party relationship like us and our partners and then the link to the member would be an example of that and then you've got the third party cookies which you use very regularly which is the stuff that you see in the news heaps right which is the how did they know that I was looking at Dyson products on Facebook and it's because you've typed it somewhere else and that data has been found so when I talk about it in the context of a law loyalty program, it's very important to us when we put something in front of you that the reason why we know this is relevant for you is something that you would understand. It's something that you would feel comfortable with because you were already believing that your relationship with Flybys would have driven that. So an example might be that we regularly see you buying within a certain category and we continue to give richness within that category. And that richness could be with just one partner or it could be multiple partners. So maybe like the barbecue category, right? So you're doing certain things in one space and it starts to improve your offers coming from lots of other spaces. But 
But when I talk about is it fair and transparent, it's that part where we consider it quite important to give people the transparency upfront as to how we're using their information and then let them make a choice around whether they're comfortable within that. I'd say within a loyalty program, most people are because that's what they understand. When I say, do they think the value they get in return is fair? People can articulate to us that they understand that they're letting us know what they're buying because in return, they get offers associated with what they're buying that add to their points bank that they can then use for whatever they want to do. So that exchange of points is the value that they're getting in return for sharing that data. And so when you think about digital advertising, a lot of digital advertising is based on the same sorts of data but it's not necessarily as clear to someone what they did that led to the personalization outcome that came next. And so really when I spoke about that in the previous podcast, it was about in the flybys world, if we make a significant change that will affect what you see, we want you to know and understand what that change was and make a willing choice to consent to it before we actually take that action. Because then it starts to feed into the, it's not being hidden from me. My data is not being used in ways that I'm not expecting. And if people start to see it that way, or they start to not see value, so whether it be a points currency or something else, if they're giving us lots of data, but the outcomes they're getting in return just feel like clutter or mess in their day-to-day lives, they'll disengage with the loyalty program. And when you think about a loyalty program, at its core, yes, its value commercially is its data, but that data only exists if people are willing to participate in the program. And so you have to be giving people good return for the data that they provide, because that's what they're signing up for. They're not just signing up to help us improve our data set. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, exactly. That, that makes sense. Now, I wanted to ask a little bit about how flybys is digitally evolving to meet the changing industry. We've kind of touched on it a bit in terms of early in the conversation, we talked about the progression from a marketing function to something more broad that fits in with the data economy. And that is definitely shaping flybys directions. Can you maybe give us a little bit of a sense of where the immediate focus is in terms of investing in capabilities to enable change? I'd say a real focus for us in the next year and probably beyond the next year is in that core loyalty offering that we do. So I think I touched on it briefly, but when you think about how you engage with a loyalty program across the journey that's involved in everything from receiving an offer to going into store, purchasing a product and collecting those points, there's actually a number of handover points between us and the partner that's involved in each of those exchanges. You know, we manage one stage of that journey and the partner manages the other side. What we're really pushing towards is further integrating those experiences to actually have your loyalty experience experiences embedded into the day-to-day of what you do with those partners. In the context of a loyalty program, you shouldn't need to come to Flyby specifically to find out everything about Flybys. You should be able to see it all when you're in Coles and you're doing those actions. You should be able to see it within their digital assets and just essentially within their own channels. And so what we're looking at is the offering of core loyalty, what kind of things need to be improved on. And some of them are really simple things. You know, there's still a lot of stuff that is delayed because of technology processing rules that we will look to automate or make real time. But then the other part is let's completely decentralize where loyalty has to come out of to allow you to interact with your loyalty offering in whatever channel you happen to be in that it's relevant. So if you're in the Coles app, let's give you a rich experience about Flybys directly in the Coles app. The same as what you would get if you were in the Flybys app and then the same for all of our other partners. So really where our focus is, is how do we get all of the richness that Flybys offers today within its own digital channels and make it available in all of our core partner channels and really amplify that experience to make the core loyalty offering everywhere that you interact with our brands. And uh, just as a final question, something I've asked pretty much every podcast guest that we've had in the last two years is what excites you about the next 12 months? Oh, well, I think what I was just touching on, I mean, it's interesting at first when you look at projects that move your customers from where they are today to a different spot, it can be scary because you might be like, oh, but like we measure ourselves against our app traffic and what if our app traffic goes down? But actually the idea that we could make loyalty something that is an experience that you can see at any retailer that you're shopping with in that day to day and in that experience, whether it's online or offline, I find that quite exciting because I think with the changes to cookies and the push of all brands now to start building one-to-one relationships, you're going to see the next phase of proliferation of loyalty programs again, because there's this greater need for people to get accounts signed up. But I think what you're going to get to is the digital equivalent of the old, well, how many cards do I want to carry in my wallet? It's like, how many accounts do I want to have saved on my phone? How many different apps do I want? How many different login credentials, all those elements there? And so I think for brands like ours that are connected to an ecosystem, the more and more that we can centralize the management of that one-to-one relationship from our own ecosystem into multiple environments, there's this real opportunity to create a bigger and richer ecosystem with a very large portion of customers because of the brands we're associated with. We're a really big part of people's weekly shop. And if we can be a part of that shop, whether they're online, or offline, 
in the partner environments as well. That's what I find really interesting. That was Katie James from Flybys. And that's the podcast for this week. We'll be back with an exciting new interview next week. Until then, you can catch all the latest headlines in Australian IT over at itnews.com.au. Listener.